We train basic training here, so we provide the required skills necessary to become a successful CBP officer. That is not what we want you to do. We want you to go from an ear to an ear. My goal for every single training that comes through here is to be successful at the academy, but most importantly, that means having the, the skills, tools, techniques, and knowledge to successfully do the job. Yeah, but an 89-day program, we have a vast amount of different training and different disciplines that are learned here. Elbows in, elbows in, eyes up, hands protecting your face. We provide the required skills necessary to become a successful CVP officer while recognizing people bring all sorts of different experiences and, and backgrounds with them. So it obviously adds to the benefit of having a very diverse class with very diverse backgrounds. We have people coming here right out of college, as well as people with a long a military history or previous law enforcement. We get people, some have zero experience in law enforcement, and this might be their first real career that they've experienced. What we really need is people with self-discipline and internal motivation to work hard and to put forth 110% effort all the my time. vehicle seized? Yeah. Is everything in my vehicle seized? And carry themselves in the utmost professional way. I have zero tolerance for unprofessional conduct. If you fail to act appropriately while you're here, we will send you home. Tracking? Yes, sir. We do a very rigorous process to select our instructors here to get some of the best CBP officers that we have in the country. We get CBP officers from all different diverse backgrounds and different skill sets. So we put a lot of expectations on our instructors, and part of that is not just to train and give them the skills and tools and techniques necessary to be successful. It's also to motivate the trainees to perform at their highest level possible. And ensuring a safe and secure training environment is absolutely critical. For someone to prepare to come to the academy, really we can break it down to three main principles. One, be in good physical condition. Two is to have an understanding and awareness of what the CBP mission is and want to be part of that. See right here the little bundles? Number three is to show up with the right mindset. Inside shuffle! Inside shuffle! Be motivated. CBP 502, first be ready to put in 110% and we'll take care of the rest. All right, the first thing that we're going to be doing is going to be getting your BMI, your weight, put your socks inside the shoes. A career in law enforcement is a very challenging thing, both physically and mentally. On the physical side of things, obviously it's a physically demanding job. You want to come in here in the best shape that you can because once you have the physical fitness side taken care of, the rest you can focus more of your time and energy on. We have stringent physical requirements for physical fitness. That's one of the first and foremost things. Once you step out from the scale, you're going to put your socks and shoes back on and you're going to start stretching out for your 220-yard distance. Just took the uh, fitness graduation standard today. It's a physical fitness test. This is the first to kind of get an assessment of where we're at. It consists of a 220 yard sprint in under 45 seconds. 30.5. Uh, max push ups at least 24 in under 60 Begin. seconds. Stay at a high plank. 30 seconds remaining. And a 1.5 mile run in under 15 minutes. Go. With the sprint as an example, there might be a situation where uh, another officer needs assistance, you know, roughly 200 yards away, and the difference between 45 seconds and 25 seconds could be uh, life or death. 13.39. Good job, sir. It was pretty tough. I came in in a pretty good fitness level, and the first two took more out of me than I thought. When they arrive on day one, we do sort of introduce a bit of stress to sort of wake them up to the next four months. The academy is predicated on discipline. 
that required discipline to be a federal law enforcement officer. My job here is the commander of troops. That really is just the opening door to the discipline that we instilled through the course of their time here. You are ready, that you are presentable. Have a seat. Are you free? They just want to see Have that you're able to follow simple instructions. If it's get out of the classroom, stand up, sit down. You know, look to your right, look to your left. You better show me that you understand and that you can follow instructions. Session at 10. Huh. Oh, God! They want to put you under pressure right away. They want to see how you're going to deal with the pressure because everybody deals with pressure differently. We were outside and they started yelling at us and you know, you're standing like this in formation, not knowing what to expect. Get down, stand up, move. They're like, what am I getting myself into? It allows even us as trainees to get more time with the instructor's training. It lends the professionalism and the discipline that they have whenever they leave here, which is really a, a very critical piece. Oh. Let's go, let's go. Academy! Drill and ceremony is fairly unique to us here on this campus. We're, we're one of the few agencies that actually do it. Attention! They go through approximately 16 hours of drill and ceremony training, plus all the practice they get doing that as well. Drill and ceremony gives you more of a command presence. It allows you to understand the importance of paying attention to detail, listening to those around you, listening to commands. And it creates a sense of teamwork, unit identity within the sessions. They typically march from class to class, as well as carry their guide on which bear their specific session number. They march constantly. They march everywhere. Anytime they have to move from one class to another, they form up in a formation and they march from one building to the other. This campus is quite large and they can cover some serious distance in the time that they're here. As a class, we come in all different civilian clothes, different parts of the country. But then the next day when we all show up in the same uniform, it kind of brings together the team aspect. Point, let's go. First cardinal safety. Treat every, like every weapon like it's loaded. Never point anything you intend to shoot. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Know your target and be on. Alright, very good guys. Throughout the 89 days of training here, an extensive amount of time is focused on firearms training and we're continually trying to evolve that training to match the evolution of threats in the field. Just like that. Again. Take a reset and back out. The firearms instructors here are top notch. They really stress the importance that you know, this is a law enforcement academy. We provide them with a baseline. So everybody that comes here, regardless of prior military, prior law enforcement, they leave these place being predictable to every other officer. Yes, they are getting more training and better training than when I went through the academy. I'm just very grateful for having the opportunity with CBP and getting the, the training and experience that I have here. I'm really excited for the field and to get more experience there. There are two things that they're really driving home in the last couple of years. Tactical medicine and active shooter. They go hand in hand. This is very likely to be fatal. And our job, if feasible, is to not let that blood loss occur. Tactical medicine is very, very important because we need to be able to continue in the fight. We need to be able to fix ourselves, fix our body so we can control the situation and then we can render aid to any innocent or first responder or even a suspect. Having 
That type of training builds the confidence in, in the trainees because they feel that they can control the situation better. Perfect, right? Yep. Good, sealed all the way around. The training that we receive here is really invaluable and it can be used on, in almost any environment that we could be put into. In case of emergencies, I have now first responder training. I feel like I can respond and, and help out. I'm gonna pancake it pretty much. You're teaching you stuff that we're gonna need to know when we get back to our reports. And, I mean, we're gonna have to go back and apply everything we've learned here. Right now, tourniquet, right leg, tourniquet, right leg. That's what I Applying want to tourniquet right is one of the most invaluable lessons I believe we're, we're taught here because all the instructors have told us controlling that bleeding is one of the most important things as far as keeping someone conscious and keeping someone alive. Being able to properly apply a tourniquet you to yourself or to somebody else and getting them that immediate yeah. medical attention is essential. They can provide themselves and others first aid. They try to expose them to multiple scenarios as well. This particular job can take you anywhere. Domestically, you're overseas. You can be working in a seaport, a land border environment. You can be working in a cargo environment. I feel very prepared. The instructors have done a great job as far as uh, making sure that we retain all the information. We call these occlusive chest seals, but a lot of times we need to vent one of our chests. Anybody can get hurt at any time. You're in a law enforcement position. If you're prepared, and you have your IFAC, and you're going after an active shooter, you feel confident in the training you have, you can save the life of yourself, save the life of someone else. Anything else. And if you respond fast enough and efficiently enough, you can do really great things in this world. Good to go, guys? Yes, sir. Our officers are trained to handle all sorts of different threats, uh, whether it be an active shooter at or near a, a port of entry or a mass casualty event. Man, shut up! We create a scenario-based training, so if they ever face a situation like that or similar, they already have some sort of experience. We use lots of role players, lots of screaming, lots of fake blood on the ground. We try to give them a true life experience that they can't get anywhere else. Active shooter can happen anytime, any place, on or off duty. Our response is to go in there in the situation, neutralize the active shooter, stop the killing of innocents, and after that, provide aid to people who are in danger. Dispatch, we have an active shooter. Building what we're trying to do is get our trainees to understand that every situation is going to be different. We always push them to their limits in a safe environment. This is a very controlled environment. They're going to have safe ways to approach an incident. We want to de-escalate as much as we can, but at the end of the day, they will be reasonable with utilizing force if it's necessary. So you're running through the building and you have your adrenaline pumping and you have no idea what's going on, where shots are coming from. My head's racing and I'm trying to think, slow down, you got this. Walk with everybody else and you need to definitely just calm down and get yourself in check to clear each room. We really try to make them explain what they did in the room. We're always working for perfection, but if they miss a little thing, you can always bring it up in debrief and say, hey, this is where we fell apart a little bit. Let's work a little bit harder on that. The more we know and the more we're able to react and respond to those situations, I think the better off we can be. When you see the light come on and you see the students stack upright and as they're moving down the hallway and you see them coming in close and sticking together and moving without hesitation, it's really a, an amazing thing for an instructor. The mock board of entries where trainees practice everything they have learned. You're close to that warrant, you can use your... We have primary inspection area simulating what they encounter at the airport. We have pedestrian area simulating a land border. Vehicle primary lanes in the back. They come and do some non-intrusive inspections here. 
We have role players as actual travelers with specific roles, and the trainees have the opportunity then to interact with those role players in a realistic environment. And it really represents the culmination of all the training that they've had. Everything comes together at this place. Here is the closest thing they have to reality, so we get to experience how the officer is gonna perform once they leave the academy. That creates that realistic environment that replicates what they're gonna see when they get back out to the field. The legal aspect is one of the most important things that we do. We have to teach them about immigration law and about passengers' rights. It, we have to walk a very fine line and protect their rights as we conduct our inspections too. We have to comply with, with standards. And it says up here, brief, brief interference with possessory rights or interests are still subject to the Fourth Amendment sometimes call them detentions, okay? But detentions are still seizures. Um, I'm gonna refer to secondary for what reason? Behavior, um, he keeps looking all around, playing with his hands on the steering wheel. Um, I think it's possibly a smuggler. It really becomes the most important piece in the puzzle of using appropriate force as determining the admissibility of a person or anything else in those realms. The legal piece becomes very critical for us. Over to secondary officer Smith has some more questions for you. Okay. All right, sir. Uh, trainees have a chance to search bags, to search vehicles, and we can teach them the methodical way of doing it. We can actually replicate what real seizures were, and we can give them that opportunity to do that methodical search and find something that's actually secreted. But by the time they get to the field, they've already experienced the work they're about, they're about to start doing in a real life environment with real life people. What are you looking for right there? I'm uh, doing an officer check to make sure the picture matches the person who's sitting right in front of It's not uncommon for a CBP officer to find a person with a fraudulent document, so we teach them those skills of how to identify those documents by incorporating the behavioral uh, analysis as well as the listening skills as well as the interviewing skills. And we combine all those things in order to give them those tools to be able to determine if somebody is the legitimate holder of that mm -hmm. document. What, what's the first thing you do when you get a document? Imposter check, right? So I have to make sure that the person... Our trainees go through extensive document analysis training. The trainees are trained in imposter detection where they get trained on facial features and how to detect an imposter as they compare a person to a document. It may appear like the person's eye has changed, but the overall shape of that eye hasn't. Right, we're really trying to build on the unscripted conversations that we need our officers to have and to develop the ability to ask follow-on questions. Um, my daughter is having our first grandbaby. Oh, how exciting. How long will you be here? Um, I'm hoping to be here up to a year. And to determine why are they looking to come to the U.S. Is it for legal purposes or is it for some criminal activity? For uh, six months. Correct. So We try to harness on their ability to continue to ask questions and to be inquisitive. We want them to be able to continue to ask follow-on questions and start to determine the legitimacy of someone's story. Do you bring any commercial merchandise? Where are you going to stay here? Where are you coming from? How far is that away from you? Doing a bachelor's? You have a ticket back? As a CBP officer, that's really what our, what our main job is. What's wrong with that picture? You don't have a ticket back from coming back to my house. As part of their training here, officers go through extensive training in law because we want them to understand what their authority is while they respect the traveler's rights. Invasive either. Seizures with a limited scope can be reasonable with lower levels of suspicion, and then seizures with a broad scope absolutely require higher levels of suspicion. The mock port of entry is a critical piece in our toolbox here at the academy. Not only do they focus on their interviewing skills, they focus on their behavioral detection, and they focus on their listening skills to understand what somebody is trying to tell them and what somebody is or isn't telling or trying to conceal. Are them. you bringing back any fruits, vegetables, plant seeds, or insects with you today, sir? Um, he keeps looking all around, playing with his hands on the steering wheel. And, um, I think it's possibly a smuggler. And that okay. creates that realistic environment that replicates what they're going to see when they get back out to the field. We protect the American public from terrorist threats. We want to have our officers ready to protect us. That is why it is important that we train the manner we do. Focus. Because America's front line starts here. Uh, let's see if we remember a little bit about uh, the importance about agriculture. 
How much money does ag generate the industry itself a year? One trillion dollars, right? Right, so agriculture is a very important part of our economics, right? Our, our industry, our livelihood here in the United States. It's what we eat, it's our economics. The agriculture specialist training is conducted uh, both here and in Frederick, Maryland. But while the CBP officers do agriculture related training, the agriculture specialists also do CBP officer related training. The threats are so severe that we do need every CBP officer to have some agriculture training. Sample of the larvae in here, in the case. But you can see the damage that the larvae actually causes to the tree. Burrows itself into the tree, cutting off all the nutrients to the tree. There's all sorts of different pests and diseases that I had no idea come in through, like, say, the, the bottom of a ship or even on the side of some of the cargo containers. And even people bringing fruits across the border that could have pests and just deplete our economy and our agriculture. This little larvae can take down a whole tree. I feel like it broadens your horizon on the laws that you're enforcing because we have to enforce cargo laws, criminal laws, and agriculture, and it just makes you think about the larger picture when you think about stuff coming into our borders that can harm our natural resources or our crops or our food supply. When we learn about agriculture, it kind of just makes you think about how something so small can have such a large impact. We all need food, so if something came in and destroyed our food supply, it could be just absolutely devastating for the country. That's what keeps us up at night and that's what keeps us doing this job. You want to make sure that nobody's bringing any of these pests or diseases in and that just stems from the things that we learned here, what to look for, where to look on the passengers, what questions to ask them, just to ensure that you're not introducing new species and invasive species to the United States. It's going to give you that situational awareness on what to look for and what to refer. If you come into this without knowing anything about agriculture, you have no idea what to look for in regards to nematodes or insects or pests that you've never heard of. So if you have that training that tells you these are in these crops or these are in these fruits or vegetables or meat or animal products, the training will always have that in the back of your mind.